On your way into worship this morning, you should have received a bag that looks like this. If, for some reason, you didn't receive one, we have members of our youth department walking the aisles right now, including up in the balcony. If you do not have one, would you raise your hand? Down here to my left, there are some hands right down at the front. Uh, whether you're in the wings or up in the balcony, just keep your hand up. They'll, they'll find you. They're on their way. We want to make certain that each one of you receives a bag. So right down here to my left, down here in the front, and I'm trying to see if I see any others. Maybe I should be checking back here. But I don't see, okay, I see everybody with their bags back here. Excellent. We're glad for that. As you're receiving your bags, I just want to make sure that you understand the context for this. And the context is that when Jesus instituted the meal that we know as the Lord's Supper, when he instituted this meal, it wasn't a thimble full of juice and a tiny wafer. That has changed throughout Christian history. What it was was a meal. His disciples gathered around a table with him. They took part in a meal as Jesus taught them. So we, in an imperfect way, no doubt, attempt to replicate that here today by having the opportunity as the teaching unfolds for you to participate in the meal we know as the Lord's Supper. I think every hand has been tended to, if I can tell. There's one more hand over here on the left in the wings, or my left, I'm sorry, all the way into the wings over here. Now, if you would take out the emblems, the juice, and the unleavened bread, and hold those emblems in your hands. Because we're going to pray and ask God's blessing on these physical symbols of Jesus' broken body and spilled blood, and ask him to bless us as we participate. So while you hold those in your hands, would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Gracious God, it doesn't cease to amaze us that you choose the most simple physical elements to represent the most profound spiritual realities. Oil for anointing, water for baptism, bread and juice for the broken body and spilled blood of Christ. But Lord, let us take not just the symbols with appreciation, but understand the realities through the discernment of the Spirit. So bless these symbols today. Bless them to our physical nourishment, yes, but even more so to our spiritual nourishment. And for that, we will thank you. And all of God's people said, amen. 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 So now I invite you to take the bread and follow Jesus' command, take, eat, and to take the juice and to follow his command, drink from it, all of you. And may God bless you as you partake. A couple of moments ago, Steve and Peggy Guptill read and read very well a passage from Matthew's Gospel, the 27th chapter. I want to go back and reread the last two verses of that passage. Now, just remember the setting, the context. The context is, and if you read here, not only in Matthew, but in the other Gospels as well, you get the context of the religious leaders with Pilate. And you get the sense that Pilate has gotten to the point where he's spitting out his words to them. He's sick and tired of them. He's done with them. And now they're back again asking for yet one more thing. He already violated his good conscience by doing what they asked him, releasing him to be crucified. And now they're back again asking, please make the tomb secure. So we pick up again and read the last two verses at that point. Here's what the record says. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. They sealed it. Now we use that term, seal, in a variety of different ways. We, for example, might say... They sealed the deal with a handshake. In other words, they reached a conclusion. They're both committed to it. They shook on it. It's sealed. 
We might use it with a favorite athlete. Oh, finally, he sealed the deal by signing the contract. So now we say, good. Our team now has this player that we hoped he would have. We, they would have. He sealed it. Or if you're building your house, you might say to the contractor, be sure you seal the roof with tar and seal the windows with silicone because in Southern California, it rains all the time. And so we use sealed in that fashion. Or in occasion, we might even use it to talk about something like an infectious disease and its spread. We say, okay, the, these people are quarantined. They are sealed off from the rest because we don't want to spread the disease. So we use sealed in a variety of different ways. The way Matthew is using it here as he quotes this conversation between Pilate and the religious leaders is a different way, though. It's what happens when we look at somebody making what we say, how could they make that decision? That's crazy. Why would, why would somebody do that? They just destroyed their life. And the way we describe that is, well, he just sealed his fate. In other words, done, finished, no coming back from that. He sealed his destiny. That is the sense in which Matthew uses it here. Like I said, I love the way Pilate says, make the tomb as secure as you know how. I'll seal it, the Roman seal. I'll provide the guard. It will be sealed. And that will say, done, finished, end of story. Well, hmm. all the world loves a good comeback story, right? Right? Haven't you found that to be true? I've heard that Americans cheer for the underdog because they love a good comeback story. I suspect that's a worldwide reality. All the world loves a good comeback story. So it was, no, it was January 3, 1993. I looked it up just to be sure, but I had it very close to right. My wife was pregnant with our firstborn, Austin. It was just after the new year, still kind of the holiday season. We had guests in town. And you know what you do when guests are there. You in, you talk, you eat, you play games. We were doing all of that, except on that day, on Sunday, it was NFL playoffs. So we turned on the TV to watch a game between the Buffalo Bills and the Houston Oilers. Houston Oilers. Now, some of you are saying, I never heard of that team. Well, you're probably right, because that team is now the Tennessee Titans. But then it was the Houston Oilers, and it was one of those games that's just a real yawner. Because by the beginning of the second half, Houston was winning the game 35-3. to Buffalo had a backup quarterback. It's done. So we moved into the other room, and we were in there playing. I don't know what it was, Monopoly, Wrist, Rook, something. We were in there playing games. But for some reason, we left the TV on, and I could kind of hear kind of his background noise, white noise. I could hear what was happening in there. And I noticed that the announcers, their voices were going up at times and sound like they were getting excited. And, and so I, I go in to look. And what was 35 to 3 in the third quarter becomes 35 to 10, becomes 35 to 17, becomes 35 to 24, becomes 35 to 31 in the third quarter. And by that time, everybody's in there saying, what is happening? By the time the game ended, Buffalo had won in overtime. It became known as the comeback. That's the way they speak of the game because it was against impossible odds, the greatest comeback in NFL history, and all the world loves a good comeback story. Right? Or what about another one from a different arena? The political arena. Don't get twitchy. I'm not going there. <laughs> I'm going back several decades ago to what has been called the most iconic political photograph in American history. Some of you were alive when this happened. I was not. Praise God. I was not. This was back. <laughs> this was back a few years ago. Now, the picture that you're looking at is of Harry Truman. He's holding up a copy of the Chicago Tribune. The headline clearly says, Dewey defeats Truman. Except that's not what happened. Truman defeated Dewey. 
They were certain this was what was going to happen. And because of an early deadline and some bad prophets, they decided, okay, we're going with this story. That was the headline. That was the story. And the exact opposite occurred. And Truman won. It was two days later, however, when this photo was taken. He was on a train traveling from his home in Missouri, traveling to D.C. They stopped in St. Louis. Somebody found a copy of the Tribune and stuck it in his hands, and he holds it up. Now, I want to read you the words of Ben Cosgrove. Ben Cosgrove is a writer for Life.com who writes a whole story on this photograph, and he says this about it. He says, the thrill evident in the face of the man holding that paper remains as indelible today as when it was captured all those years ago. In fact, he makes the case in his article that the reason the photo is so iconic is not just because of the wrong headline. Obviously, that was part of it. But it was because of the look on Truman's face. That, he says, is what makes it iconic. He continues, it's a defining image of more than a politician. The picture, listen to this sentence, the picture captures the feeling of sweet, improbable victory for a person who had been counted out too soon. It captures the sweet joy of being signed, sealed, delivered, it's over, done. It's the end of the story, except that, well, actually it's not. So, Buffalo Bills... Harry Truman, Matthew. Matthew writes and says, sealed, stone, guard, finished. Well, turns out God enjoys an incredible comeback story as well. Because then we go to Matthew 28. Now, it's easy to miss this. Say you're reading through the Bible, you're reading a chapter a day, you read Matthew 27, you come to the end of 27, the seal stone, you close your Bible, next day you pick it up, you start at Matthew 28, and and, and you miss the tension that exists between what was just stated and what is now stated. Because with that sealed tomb clearly in view, then Matthew writes this next. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. So what happens? Earthquake, dazzling angel, frightened guards, terrified women, and a toppled over stone with an angel seated on it. Do you know when you sit down? You sit down when the job's done. You sit down when the victory's won. You sit down when the battle has been secured. You sit down when the enemy has been defeated. You sit down when what was certain to be the ending wasn't the ending, but this one is. And it says, and the angel Set down. Wow. It doesn't cease to amaze me how the gospel writers can tell the most momentous stories with the most simple phrases. Stunning realities, monumental moments, and just a phrase or two. For example, just a page or so before that, Matthew tells us the story of the crucifixion. Now he, as do the other gospel writers, gives us details about all the events surrounding it. What happened in those final days and what happened leading up to that moment. But when it comes to telling the actual moment of the crucifixion, you can almost miss it. Now let that sink in for a moment. This moment that stands at the pinnacle of human history, 
This moment that has become the epitome of a statement of love. This moment when we see the heights of God, the grandeur of his love, his willingness to reach to the lowest depths, to, to bring his creation back to himself. As has often been said, the pulpit from which Jesus preached his most powerful sermon on love. That moment of crucifixion, if you blink, you miss it. Oh, you get the details around it. But the gospel writers are not going to satisfy our looky-loo carnal curiosity about the macabre events that hap- event that happens there. This is the event about which Paul will let her, later say, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ. I want, to, I want you to notice how Matthew tells it. This is... Not too many verses before the one we read earlier, Matthew 27, verse 32. As they were going out, we're going to get the scenes. We're going to get some of the details around it. As they were going out, they met a man from Simon named Simeon, pardon me, from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. Now... Here comes how Matthew tells the moment of the crucifixion. When they had crucified him. That's it. Not satisfying any curiosity here. Not drawing any macabre pictures here. Not titillating the, the bloodlust of people. He just says, when they had crucified him. And then he goes on to other details. They divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Stunning. Stunning in its simplicity. But if it tells us anything, it tells us when we're reading these gospels, when we're reading what happened at the end of Jesus' life, Pay attention to the little details because a great deal can be contained in very simple words. We read it just a few moments ago. Here we have a sealed tomb. End of story. His destiny, his fate, says Pilate and the priests and the Pharisees and the religious leaders is done. Matthew says, rolled back the stone and set on it. Simple. I want to read you the words of two New Testament scholars who comment on this. First, Michael Wilkins, who writes, entrances to burial tombs were sealed in a variety of ways. This one was sealed by a cylindrical stone that rolled up a trough, which was wedged open while a body was being attended inside the chamber. Matthew alone relates that as the angel of the Lord rolls away the stone, he sits on it. The stone that was sealed by the guards to assure that the body of Jesus would remain in the crypt now becomes the seat of triumph for the angel. The stone is rolled away not to let the risen Jesus out, but to let the women in to witness the fact of the empty tomb. Catch that carefully because the gospel writers themselves will tell us later in the days after Jesus' resurrection that he apparently, I'm just saying, reporting what they say, goes through closed doors and walls to be with him when they've shut everyone else out. And suddenly, where did you come from? Thus, Wilkins' point, the stone is rolled away not to let him out but to let us in so that once we get in, we see something has happened here. I've had the wonderful privilege of being at the place that probably with some pretty good evidence is where Calvary was and where the tomb was. And I've stood in line waiting to get into that tomb. And when finally we got into that tomb, we stood there and were overwhelmed with one reality that's captured in three words. It is empty. Empty. There's no one here. 
Arnold Toynbee wrote, find the bones of that Jew and Christianity crumbles into ruins. The problem is they never did find them because it was empty. And when the women were there and they were viewing the empty tomb, there was an angel outside chilling out. God, he says, loves a good comeback story. And you have just witnessed the greatest one of all. Now, last night, here in this sanctuary, we went to Gethsemane. We went to that garden where Jesus fought the true battle. Here, Jesus was fighting with the reality that faced him the human nature within him that didn't want to be separated from the Father or endure what was coming. Jesus, falling to the ground, the gospel writer said, as though dead, Luke adds, sweating great beads of perspiration as though it were great drops of blood and crying out to his Father, Father, please take this cup away. Please. But then he ends, nevertheless, not my will, but yours that's where the battle is fought. Because when Jesus walks out of Gethsemane, now under guard, the decision has been made. Now he's going to face the realities of the consequences of the decision he made. And now what he says is very different. No longer is it, Father, take this cup away. That has been decided. Now it's, Father, forgive them. They don't understand what they're doing. It's women, don't, don't weep for me. Don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and your children. It's a different Jesus because the decision has been made. And thus we stood in Gethsemane last night, and with apologies to the musician Crowder, we said, earth has no sorrow that heaven can't feel. Because if you go into Gethsemane, the one thing of which you can be certain is you're not the first one there. Jesus has already been there. There is nothing you feel or experience that heaven can't also feel and hasn't also felt. But that was last night. That was Gethsemane. Today, we're in a garden at a tomb, and it is empty. And so as we stand at that tomb, we are not saying earth has no sorrow that heaven can't feel. Now we're saying earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal because God loves a good comeback story. Somebody here today is at that dead end. You're standing at that sealed tomb. It's as though that Roman guard stands facing you saying your story is over, it's done. It may be physical, a grim diagnosis. It may be marital, an impenetrable and yet invisible wall that separates the two of you. It may be professional. I don't know where to go next. I don't know what that dead end at the tomb is for you. But I do know this. God loves a good comeback story. And he's told the greatest one of all. There's a lot I don't know. I don't know how he will turn it around for you. Maybe through natural causes that God has created when he created a world with causes and consequences. Maybe through medicine and science. It may be through some move of the spirit in a marriage counseling office. I don't know how he'll do it. I don't know when he'll do it. Don't know if he'll do it now or tomorrow or next year or when the kingdom is finally and fully realized. I don't know whom he will use to do it, whether it will be someone trained in the art and opening their life to God, and therefore they're guiding your marriage, guiding your professional life, guiding your physical treatment. And I don't know where he'll do it, whether it's here in a worship service or in a clinician's office or a therapist's couch, or some morning when you are worshiping him alone in nature. I don't know where he'll do it. So there's a lot I don't know. But there is one thing I do know. One thing in which I am confident. 
one reality on which I have staked my life. And it can be stated very simply. And that is this. When you come to that dead end, that tomb that is sealed, that guard that stands in your way, whatever else may be true about all that we don't know, this is true. Christ is risen. He is, he is risen indeed. 